Well, good morning. Uh, we are in the last week of our series on heaven and hell. And uh, I want, before we dive in, I just want to mention uh, the schedule for the next few weeks. After this week, I'm actually going to go over to Southwood and I will preach the Heaven and Hell series for four weeks over at Southwood. Over here, Blake Jennings, uh, our Southwood teaching pastor, is going to come over. He'll be here for four weeks and he is going to preach a series on the subject of hope. Hope in the face of discouragement, hope in the face of anxiety and depression, uh, and basically address how do we as Christians walk through those types of issues in a way that is consistent with what God says in His Word. I think it's going to be a great uh, series. I think it's going to be a great series. You're going to enjoy it. And so I'll be back right around uh, spring break time. So for the next four weeks, Blake will be here. I'll be over there. I hope you enjoy hearing from him. Uh, now, as we move into our last week on Heaven and Hell, I want to start the morning uh, by asking for a couple of volunteers. I have a little exercise I want us to do together. Not a physical exercise. This is a mental exercise. Uh, if you volunteer, there might be a $5 Amazon gift card in it for you. So can I get two volunteers? Okay, right here, I see one person. Any, uh, you are getting volunteered. Okay, come on. Come on up, unless your son wants to participate. So, yeah, but come, but come on up. Oh, he wants to do it. Okay, okay. Okay, all right. Oh, you, okay, so you, you, do you teach him in Sunday school? Okay. Oh, this is perfect. Okay, I love it. All right. Even, actually, this is even better. Okay, now, uh, why don't y'all give us your names so we know who everybody is? Caleb. Caleb? And I'm Colton. Colton. All right, Caleb and Colton. Okay, so this is a Bible trivia quiz. The winner will claim $5 from Amazon. All right, we're going to start with Caleb. Caleb, according to Genesis 1-1, who created the heavens and the earth? God. Perfect. You got it. Good job. All right. All right, Colton. What was the name of the prophet Isaiah's father? Okay, Amos. Amos. Okay. Caleb, uh, the Bible is divided into two major sections. Can you name them? Old Testament and New Testament. That's absolutely right. All right. <laughs> Colton, uh, what were the Hebrew names of Daniel's three friends? So not, their, uh, not the names they were given in Babylon, but the Hebrew names. Okay. Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah. You know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think, I think most of us knew that one. Okay, all right. All right, third and final question, Caleb. Who wrote the book of First Peter? Peter. Perfect. Okay, you got it. All right, uh, Colton. Acts 17.34 mentions two people who believed the gospel when Paul preached it at the end of the chapter. What were their names? <laughs> Dionysius the Areopagite and Damaris. Okay, now, because you were a good sport, I actually have gift cards for both of y'all. Okay, now, as, thank you guys, yeah. Now, young, sit down. As you figured out, that was extremely unfair. Uh, I rigged the quiz, and I actually was hoping uh, to, to have a situation like that where the student would outpace the teacher in the... Uh, the quiz. Now, the reason I did that this morning is because when we talk about unfairness, my guess is that some of you, obviously most of you, after the first question, you went, that's unfair, right? That's not right. The game is rigged. One person has much easier questions than the other person. Now, uh, I would sense that there are people, perhaps, that at times you've thought that about the way God has arranged the world that the world itself is unfair, that maybe the game is rigged. So over the last few weeks, as we have been talking about heaven and hell, there are questions that come up in our minds anytime we address this subject. So when we say, look, the only way to have eternal life, to receive eternal life, is to believe in the gospel, to believe in Jesus. One question that comes up is, well, then what about people who have never heard of Jesus? Is it fair that some people live in a country or in a family where they hear about Jesus all the time, but other people live in a country or a family where they have never heard about Jesus? Is that fair? 
What about people who die before they can even understand the gospel? What about very small children or infants or the mentally handicapped who simply can't understand the gospel? Right? We look around the world and it, do, it doesn't take long to have those sorts of questions. Why are some people smarter than others? Some people are uh, better looking than others. Some people have more money than others. Some people are born in a family that knows God and others are not. Why is it that the world seems unfair? Those types of questions, if we're honest, they really can trouble us. Why is it that there are people who seem very, very nice and very, very kind, and yet if they don't trust Jesus, the scripture seems to indicate they'll spend an eternity in hell apart from him? Is that fair? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you remember last week when we were talking on the subject of hell, I mentioned the author Rob Bell, uh, who used to be a pastor, and the book he wrote called Love Wins. And uh, his book, he disagrees with pretty much all of the conclusions that I have drawn throughout my series. But at the beginning of his book, he asks some really good questions. I want to show you just one quote from his book on this subject of the fairness of God. Here's what he says. Of all the billions of people who have ever lived, will only a select number make it to a better place and every single other person suffer torment and anguish forever? Is this acceptable to God? Has God created millions of people over tens of thousands of years who are going to spend eternity in anguish? Can God do this or even allow this and still claim to be a loving God? All right, so that's a difficult question. And if we're honest, many of us have asked those types of questions. So what do we do with those questions? What I want to do this morning is I want to go to the scripture and we're going to make an attempt to answer this sort of question from God's word. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not going to explain to us everything about the doctrine of election or the mysteries of God or why God specifically has put one person in one family and another person in another family in another country. I don't know the specifics of God's plan. But what we are going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's draw some broad contours about God's character. Who is he? Because I think in order to answer this type of question, really what we need to look at is what sort of God do we worship? What's he like? And as we understand what he's like, I think we'll begin to understand a little bit more of how he has arranged the world so that men and women can come to know him. And so that in the end, I think where we want to land is to say this, I can trust God because I can trust that his judgments are always right. And then I can worship God because he's good and he's loving and yet he's also holy and righteous at the same time. That's really where we're going to land. So let's begin with the discussion of who is God and how does that help inform these questions of God's fairness. The first point that we want to make this morning is this. God is just. God is just. Now, if you remember, if you were here last week when we talked about hell, the very first point about hell was hell is just, right? And what, what we meant by that was that hell really, as we see it play out in the scripture, heaven and hell are consistent with the righteous or just character of God. In other words, everything in the universe is really an expression of God's character, who he is, his justice, and we'll see his mercy and his grace and his love at the same time. And you may remember, we also talked about the distinction between fairness and justice. You remember that distinction? And I'll admit that uh, I kind of titled my sermon a little bit in a misleading way this morning. Uh, because I say, is God unfair? Right? He is, if by fair, we mean that everybody always gets the same things all the time. So here's the way you might think about fairness versus justice. Remember when you were in elementary school and maybe uh, in your lunch, you brought a bag of M&Ms or something for dessert, right? And so you're sitting at lunch and you begin to share some of your M&Ms with a couple of kids next to you. You hand out some M&Ms to them and they enjoy it. And maybe a teacher comes by and the teacher says, hey, Billy, did you bring enough M&Ms for everybody? And you think, well, no, I don't, I don't actually like everybody here, right? I only brought enough M&Ms for me and my friends. I didn't bring enough for everybody. Now, what is the teacher concerned about? She's concerned about fairness, isn't she? She wants to make sure everybody gets an equal portion 
of M&Ms. Another uh, way to think about it might be if you are a parent, perhaps you have some sort of electronic device, an iPad, a computer, a video game console, and your kids say, look, can I play on the iPad? All right, this may or may not have happened in my house, right? And you say, you may, for 20 minutes, you may play on the iPad. And so one kid plays and you get distracted and that kid stretches his time to 22 minutes and 35 seconds, right? Now, what's going to happen when the next kid gets his turn on the iPad? And you remember after 20 minutes, you say, hey, your time's up. What's he going to say? Well, my sibling got 22 minutes and 35 seconds. I know because I was timing from the other room. I should get 22 minutes and 35 seconds. Now, what's the appropriate response? Nobody deserves the iPad at all, right? There's justice and then there's fairness. Justice says, look, nobody actually deserves to play a game on the iPad. I can take it away at any time. Now, fairness would say everybody gets the exact same amount. There is a distinction between justice and fairness. As you look at the scripture, here's what we see. God is always just in the sense that his judgments are always correct. All right, so that when somebody is condemned for their sin and rebellion against God, there will not be anybody who can stand before God and say, you made the wrong decision. God always does what is right. A couple of passages, Job chapter 34, verses 10 to 12. This is at the end of the book of Job, and this is in the speech of Elihu. Elihu is one of the few people in the book of Job who seems to speak correctly about God. And Elihu, this young man, he says this, therefore listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. For he pays a man according to his work and makes him find it according to his way. Surely God will not act wickedly and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Ultimately, Elihu says, look, in the grand scheme of things, you will not be able to look, Job, and say, hey, God was unjust. God did what was wrong. God will always do what is right. Even though it isn't the same as what God has done in the life of somebody else, God is always just or righteous or true. Romans chapter 3 puts it this way, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you judge. Now that word justified in Romans, it's often used of people being justified, and it is you are declared to be in the right. And the idea of what Romans 3 is saying is that God at the end of it all will be declared to be in the right, that the judgments he makes are correct. Now we say, hey, it's easy to say that, right? It's easy to say that God is just. What evidence do we have that God's judgments are actually just? All right now, bear with me for a minute because we're going to dive a little bit deeply into a couple of concepts. Here's what we see in Scripture. And this goes back to what we talked about with the iPad illustration a moment ago. What is ultimately just? Well, nobody deserves a game on the iPad. As we look at Scripture, here's what we see. What do we deserve? What is just? Justice would be condemnation for everybody. The justice of God would be every single person has sinned and run away from God, and we deserve an eternity in hell. Here's what we see as you walk through the book of Romans, a couple of critical passages. Chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How do we know they suppress the truth? Well, he goes on. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. In other words, here's what he says. God has been revealing himself in creation and inside of us ever since the beginning of time. And God has been calling out, listen to me, believe in me, follow me. There's nobody that's gonna stand before God and say, hey, I didn't know. You didn't say anything. Instead, the testimony of Scripture is that the justice of God would mean everybody gets condemned to an eternity apart from God because of sin and rebellion against God. Romans will go on, in fact, to talk about how the law is written on our hearts. Romans chapter 2, he says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, 
These not having the law are a law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. In other words, here's what he's saying. Inside of everybody who's been created, there's a conscience that says some things are right and some things are wrong. So that nobody can stand before God and say, you know, when I, when I sinned, when I disobeyed, when I rejected God, I didn't, I didn't have any way of knowing better. Paul says, no, God wrote it on our hearts. Years ago, I ran across a quote from a book by an evolutionary psychologist. The book was called Moral Minds. And there was a quote in the book. This guy uh, who wrote the book is not a Christian. He is an atheist, in fact. But he said this in the book, there appears to be some kind of unconscious process driving moral judgments without its being accessible to conscious reflection. All right, what's he saying? He's saying, basically, I'm writing an entire book to get to the bottom of this question. Why do people inherently have a sense of what is right and what is wrong without really thinking about it? You go across cultures, you go through different religions, and there are certain things that everybody goes, that's not right, and that is right. That's what Paul is saying. So that when we talk about the justice of God, God can say to everybody, look, you had standards, even in your own heart, of what was right and what was wrong, and you know you failed them. And those standards were implanted in you by God who created you. And so that's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? Everybody deserves punishment and condemnation. Now, the big question that comes up, though, is, well, but is it fair or just, is it just to receive an eternal sentence for essentially crimes that were committed in a finite period of time, right? I only have a finite life, and, and yes, I sinned and I rebelled against God during this life, but why would I receive an eternal sentence? Here's how I believe the Scripture answers that, and I think we recognize this, that the severity of our sentence, the severity of our punishment— is not determined by how long it takes to commit a crime, but it is determined by the severity of the crime itself. All right, here's what I mean. Uh, think back maybe 10, 12 years. Think about the Enron and WorldCom scandals. You remember those, right? Giant corporations where over a period of years, the executives lied about their books and they essentially stole money from investors and it was a multi-year type of scandal. Right when, when these scandals were uncovered, of course, uh, these executives, they were convicted. They were sentenced to a prison term, right? But, but really, the, the maximum term any of those executives got at Enron or WorldCom was about 25 years, right? About 25 years. But it took them years to commit those crimes, didn't it? For, for years, they were lying. Years, they were stealing. Years, they were deceiving. On the other hand, if you or I were to walk into a shop this afternoon and shoot the proprietor in cold blood, and it takes 30 seconds, we'd go to jail for the rest of our lives, wouldn't we? We might be executed. Why is that? Because the duration and severity of the punishment is correlated to the severity of the crime and not the length of how long it takes to commit the crime. And here, when we talk about the justice of God, here's what I think we fail to see, is that sin and rebellion against God is a capital crime because God has been speaking. God has been reaching out. And what we have done is we have said, I want no part of the God who made me, of the God who wants to know me, and we've decided to destroy ourselves and others. And I think all too often, here's what happens. We look around and we say, well, yeah, I, I, I know some people or I know of some people who probably belong in hell, right? So our minds go to Hitler, for example, or a serial killer, and we go, they belong there. Right? But I'm pretty good. I'm pretty nice. You remember when we talked about hell last week, I explained 66% of Americans believe hell exists, but like 2% think they belong there. Why is that? Hell exists, but for people worse than me. And we all think that. We minimize the severity of our own crimes and sins. The scripture says, no, God's justice actually means all of us have sinned against God to the degree that we have merited eternal condemnation. Hey, that's, that's the really bad news. 
when we talk about the justice of God, all of us deserve condemnation. All right, but as we move forward, not only is God just, but also God is gracious. As you move through the scripture, you see not only is God just, but God is deeply gracious. And the prime illustration of his grace, of course, is that he gave his own son, Jesus Christ, right? John 3, 16, probably the first passage you ever memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave his son to save sinners, right? So when we talk about the justice of God, we always want to follow it up and say, but God is gracious. Right? So God, without violating his holiness, found a way to satisfy his justice. And that is he placed all the punishment for sin on his son, who is eternally God and now forever is human as well. And he placed that punishment on a perfect man who is the son of God in our place. Jesus died for us and rose again. That's what we're saying is that all of our sin fell upon Jesus. And all who trust in Jesus Christ have eternal life. Right? That's the grace of God. And so we see God is reaching out and God has provided a way of reconciliation. Now again, when we talk about this, this raises some of the questions I brought up at the beginning. One of those questions is this. What about those then who cannot understand the gospel? Right, so we say, look, anybody who believes in Jesus will have eternal life, and you have to believe in Jesus in order to have eternal life. What about people who can't believe in Jesus? So if a baby dies or a, somebody who is mentally handicapped to the point they can't understand these concepts, what happens to those people? I want to talk about that for just a minute. Okay, it's, a, it's a tricky question because the Scripture actually doesn't directly answer it. There's no verse that says, hey, all babies go to heaven. It's not in there. But what we want to do is we want to look at the character of God for just a minute and say, what can we conclude based on the character of God that is most likely? When we talk about the grace of God, I want to look at a couple of passages this morning. First one is this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Okay, it says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I point that out. That doesn't mean all people will be saved. Hopefully, we've made that clear as we've walked through this series. What it means is this, that God's heartbeat is that no, none should perish. John says that as well. All right, so we begin with that as the groundwork. God's heartbeat is none, that none should perish. God has placed the sins of humanity on his son, and Jesus rose from the dead, defeating death and sin and Satan forever. And God wants people to know him. That's the orientation. God is not trying to keep people from him. He is trying to bring people to himself. And what we also know is this, because that's God's orientation, as we look through the scripture, the thing that we see is that God does not hold people accountable for what they are incapable of doing. In other words, the severity of one's uh, judgment, remember, is based upon what? The severity of the crime. So as you look in, for example, the book of Luke, you see passages like this. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. In other words, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying, look, the person who really didn't know any better gets off a lot lighter. Right? The person who understood and still did the wrong thing gets a harsher, much harsher punishment. Jesus would also say uh, this, he, he, talking to uh, Bethsaida and Chorazin, two cities in Galilee. He says, look, it's going to be worse for you guys on the day of judgment than it will be for Tyre and Sidon. Okay, Tyre and Sidon were terrible places. They were places filled with idolatry, violence, sexual immorality. The people in Bethsaida and Chorazin were basically nice people who tried to follow the law but they rejected Jesus. And the reason their judgment will be harsher is this, because they had more information. They knew more, so they're held more accountable. So what am I getting at? I do not believe that God holds people accountable for what they are incapable of understanding. 
And so as we look at the character of God, I think that that would mean that those who are infants or those who are mentally handicapped to the point of not being able to understand, God finds a way for the grace of God in Jesus Christ to apply to them, and they would end up with him for eternity. Think about it uh, in these terms. If you have kiddos, maybe you've got a toddler, you know, 12 to 18 months, somewhere in that range. Uh, Maybe you were once a toddler, and you'll understand this as well. Uh, You walk into a store, and you shop, and then maybe at some point while you're in there, you're in Target or whatever, uh, your toddler grabs something off the shelf, Uh, you know, a bag of candy or a little toy or whatever. This actually has happened once or twice when we had little bitty kids. You get out in the parking lot, and you look down, and that kid has something in their hands that you know you didn't buy, right? So now you're outside the store, and you realize that your baby has stolen something from the store. So what do you do? Well, hopefully you turn back around, you go into the clerk or the manager and you say, hey, my child took this off the shelf. I'm here to return it. And what does that manager do? He calls the cops, right? He calls the cops and they come out and they put your kid in tiny little handcuffs and they put him in a cruiser and they take him to baby jail, don't they? No, of course not, right? Because we recognize the child is not culpable for what he doesn't understand. It's funny, I um, was thinking about that this week and then I had a dream that my son was a baby again and this happened to him and they actually did. They put him in little handcuffs in my dream and he was in the back of a cruiser and they took him off to jail and I woke up and I was just so angry. Like, that's not right. He doesn't get it. He doesn't know, right? That's your reaction to that scenario. Now, if we recognize that in our own sense of justice, I think we look at the scripture and we say, okay, we, I believe, can conclude based on what we know about God that those who are truly incapable of understanding, God somehow applies the grace of Jesus to them because they can't reject the gospel because they can't even understand the gospel. Okay, so God is just, but God is also Gracious. Now, the the next question, of course, that always comes into our minds when we talk about this is, okay, uh, babies, those who can't understand, I get it, but what about those who simply have never heard the gospel, right? What about those who are uh, either grown adults, they've got a perfectly functioning mind, or they're, they're old enough to understand, but maybe they live somewhere where they've never heard the gospel, or maybe they live in this country, and nobody ever took them to church, nobody ever told them the good news. Right, what do we do biblically about those folks? And that's where our final point this morning is going to come in. God is just and God is gracious. Thirdly, God is always reaching out to everybody. All right, God is always reaching out to everybody. And what we see in the scripture, this is critical, is that ultimately people reject God. God doesn't reject people. Right? People are held accountable for their rejection of God. Right? Nowhere in the scripture do we ever see that God says, you are going to hell because I want you there. But instead, it is always, you stand before God in judgment and you are held responsible. God is reaching out all the time in many, many, many ways. Right? The story of the Bible is actually not a story of people looking for a God that they can't find. The story of the Bible is actually God chasing down people who are running away over and over and over again. And and the, the pattern that emerges in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, is that those who are truly seeking, they will find him. Those who are truly seeking, they will find him. In fact, Acts chapter 17, when Paul is speaking uh, in Athens to a group of pagan men and women, Gentile pagans, Remember, he gets up and he says, you guys have a monument here. I saw this monument. It says, to an unknown God. In other words, somebody in Athens recognized, hey, there's all these other gods, and then there's some other God out there that we don't know. And Paul says, I'm here to tell you who he is. And he begins to explain the gospel. And one of the things he says in the course of this speech is he says, and he, that is God made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Why? That they would seek God. And perhaps they might grope for him and find him, 
though he's not far from each one of us. In other words, Paul says, look, God isn't hiding away in a corner. He's right there. He's put you where he wants you so that you will find him. You need to understand God is always shouting out. He's shouting in creation. He's shouting in your conscience. He's shouting through his word. He shouted through his son. God is always saying, I'm here, I'm here. And he says, he puts you right where he wants you so that you may grope for him and find him. All right, and that's the pattern that we find in Scripture. So that when we look, we, when we look around the world and we look in Scripture at the concept of other faith systems that do not accept the God of the Scripture, what we actually see is this. Those are not attempts to find God. Those are attempts to run away from God. Those are humanity's way of saying, I don't agree or want to follow the God revealed in creation, the God revealed in conscience, so I will build my own. A God that I can reach by doing good things. A God that will let me be my own Savior. And yet there are always some in every culture, in every time, who say, no, I look around and I want to find the God who is not the God that I make. Hebrews chapter 11. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe this, that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, look, if you're a dad and your son asks you for an egg, you're not gonna give him a stone, are you, a rock? Or if he asks for a fish, you're not gonna give him a snake, right? A son who asks for a gift a loving father gives it. He says, how much more will the father give good gifts to those who ask him? In fact, he says, the Holy Spirit, to those who seek him. And so as you look through the scripture, what you see actually is that those who want to know God, even if they're not Jewish, even if they don't live in a place where uh, the God of the Israelites is talked about a lot, those who seek him, tend to find him. Let me give you a couple of uh, illustrations from the scripture. Acts chapter 8. Some of you will remember Acts chapter 8, the story of Philip. Remember, Philip was this kind of deacon, a servant in the early church. And one day Philip is preaching and, and God comes to him and says, Philip, I want you to go down to this road that goes to Gaza. And so Philip goes, okay. So he goes down to the road and he sees a chariot. And inside the chariot, there is an Ethiopian royal official who's sitting in the chariot and he's reading a scroll. He's reading the scroll uh, of Isaiah, right? I don't know how he got it, probably because he traveled back and forth to Israel. Somebody gave him this scroll. So he's sitting there and he's reading it and the chariot's going along and the horses are going along and God says, Philip, go up and talk to that guy, right? So the scene's a little funny because Philip runs up. It says he runs to the chariot, right? And he says, do you understand what you're reading, right? And I've always pictured Philip kind of trying to keep up. And the guy looks out and you can imagine somebody's running next to my vehicle, right? And the guy goes, well, how can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? And Philip goes, stop the chariot. Let me get inside. And he gets inside and he looks and the guy's reading Isaiah 53, the great passage about the death of the Messiah for sin. And he says, who's who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself? Is he talking about somebody else? It says, Philip began with that very passage and he explained the good news about Jesus to this guy. And then the crazy thing is he gets out of the chariot and God just like takes Philip to another place. He just disappears. All right, but here's a guy looking for God. God says, I'm gonna send a messenger. You see it with Cornelius in Acts 10 as well. Cornelius is a Gentile who he has come in contact with the God of the Israelites. And he says, I believe in that God. I do not believe in the gods of the Romans but he wants to know more. And you you know from this passage, he begins to pray that he would know God and know him better. And God sends Peter right to his door. And Peter says, Cornelius, your prayers have been answered because I'm here to bring you good news. Over and over and over again, the pattern that we see is that those who seek him find him. Those who look at the information God has given and say, yeah, I want to know that God. God finds a way for them to know Jesus. Now we say, hey, that's in the Bible. That was a long time ago. Uh, Does that ever happen today? I would say this, um, throughout my years in ministry and then my years of 
traveling overseas. I've seen variations on this story over and over and over again. In fact, last summer, uh, you know that a group of us went to Athens, Greece. And uh, while we were in Athens, we were interacting with uh, one of uh, the men who was kind of on staff with the organization we were working with. He was our translator. He was from Pakistan. He was from a Muslim country. And he had fled from his country and he had come into Athens. And when he got into Athens, uh, he was trying to find work and he took a day job, a a job for a day with um, a guy who kind of demolished houses. And so they sent our, our friend into this house and they said, you need to demolish all of this stuff by the end of the day. So he grabs a hammer or whatever and he begins to work. He gets about halfway through the day and this man says, I can't finish this job. It's too much for one guy. I don't know why you would hire just one person. So he drops all the tools and he says, I quit. And he walks away and he begins to walk down the road away from the job. And the man who hired him sees him leaving and he goes, oh, well, wait a second, friend. Where are you going? Where are you going? He says, I, I quit. And he goes, well, hold on. I haven't paid you for the the time that you worked, for the half day that you worked. The guy goes, well, you're going to pay me for that? All right, why would you pay somebody who quit? He goes, well, you worked. You worked half the day. We made an agreement. So he paid him for the half day. And and our friend walked away, and, and that began to bother him because he said, you know, where I come from, nobody would do that. He said, this guy, nobody was watching him. There wasn't anybody watching him to see if he paid me. He had no incentive to do it other than that he must have thought it was right. And he goes, where would he get the idea that he thought it was right? Nobody was watching. And then he thought, he must think his God is watching him. But what kind of God would insist that he do something like that? Because the God that I learned about wouldn't. And he thought, I want to know that God. And he began to study and asked questions of Christians, and he learned about Jesus. Uh, Years ago, there was a man who gave a sermon over at our Anderson campus, a a very good friend of uh, Brian Fisher, our pastor. And uh, this man's name was Babu, also from Pakistan, and he grew up in a Hindu environment. Lots of gods. They worshipped gods that that, that did all kinds of things, brought the crops and, you know, all of these different things. But uh, in his early life, people around him began to die. Family members began to die, and he began to ask this question. He asked his grandmother, hey, which of these gods controls life and death? Which of these gods can bring someone back from the dead? And his grandmother kind of said, hey, you asked too many questions. Go do something productive and send him away. But he couldn't get it out of his mind. There has to be a God. There has to be a God that controls life and death. And he, in a dream, saw a vision that he would get a book from a white man and he'd learn about Jesus. So when he met a missionary, he saw the book and he believed in Jesus because he was seeking. One or two more really quickly. Years ago, when I was in college ministry, I asked some of our students who had gone overseas for a longer period of time, a year or two, to send me stories where somebody was seeking to know about God and they learned the gospel. This one stood out. One woman said that she talked to a a, a lady. This was in North Africa. She said, this lady told me that she was dreaming that she fell in a pit of trash, slime, and filth and couldn't get out. She kept trying and trying, but couldn't climb out by herself. She looked up and saw a man in bright white clothes at the top of the pit. He reached down to pull her out, and he had a hole in his hand. And so she began to ask, who is it that would pull me out? who has holes in his hands, and she learned about Jesus. What am I getting at? God is just and gracious, and he's always speaking. And he can use whatever means that he wants to use. And the testimony of Scripture is this, that when somebody says, yeah, I see God's eternal power and divine nature in creation. I see it written on my heart. I want to know that God, that God sends them more information and more information and more information. He is a rewarder of those who seek him so that we can trust his judgments. So God is just, God is gracious, God is reaching out to everybody. As we close, a few thoughts by way of application. The first thing is this, we can trust him. It's not going to show up, so I'll just tell you all. We can trust him. 
We respond to him in faith. It may be that you are in here this morning and uh, you haven't yet trusted in God through Jesus Christ. You, you don't yet have a relationship with him. You have not believed in Jesus. The message of the morning is that God has made a way for you to be reconciled to him in Jesus Christ. And so, so this morning may be the morning that the Spirit is saying, trust in him. Okay, if you know him, you can trust his judgments. You can know that his judgments are good. Right? That he always does what is right. So trust in him. Secondly, proclaim the gospel. If I think about those stories about, uh, you know, Philip and, and Peter, this, this Ethiopian man, and then Cornelius, and I go, you know, the, the means ultimately that God used for those people to hear about Jesus was God sent somebody to them who knew. Right? And it may be that, that you're that person for somebody at work, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your family. Right? And it's not that God won't reach them without you. It's that God wants to give you the privilege of participating of having the joy of being that individual who gets to share the message, right? The Great Commission isn't a burden, it's a privilege for us to participate in the sharing of the good news. And then thirdly, we worship him. We worship him for his character. Uh, We're gonna celebrate communion as we close. And as we celebrate communion, what we really are celebrating is just what we've been talking about this morning, that in his grace and his love, God found a way for us to be reconciled to him in Jesus, that he placed all of our sin on Jesus Christ. Jesus gave his body and his blood for us, and then he rose again, and he offers eternal life. And so we worship him for who he is and that we can trust him. So as the elements come around, Spend a few moments just in praise of God's love and goodness. And then also spend a few moments asking this question, uh, is there somebody in your life this week that you sense the Spirit saying, maybe you are the one that God is sending to share the good news with somebody who is seeking? Let's uh, ponder that as the elements come around.